everyone, and welcome back to the Criminal Law Panel. My name is Michael Amick, and I'm a medical student at the Yale School of Medicine and a member of the Sports Equity Lab. I'm honored to have the opportunity to moderate this panel today. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment just to thank John Vaughn and Tiffany Thomas Lopez for the bravery and courage they showed to speak about their experiences and to help us bring this very real issue to the forefront of our minds and to engage in this conversation. I would also like to thank the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law for hosting this event and giving us a venue to speak, to listen, and to learn about this important topic. And finally, th to thank Professor Amos Giora for bringing attention to this issue through his work and his most recent book entitled Armies of Enablers. For the next hour and a half, we will be holding a conversation focused on the legal rights of victims and thinking about the intersection between those who are victims of sexual abuse and the law. The structure for this panel will include each of our three panelists who will speak for 15 minute segments each, after which we will transition into a discussion for the last 30 minutes. I encourage the audience to be inquisitive and active in thinking about this topic and to please utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom throughout the presentation to ask questions that we'll, we will save until we open into discussion at the end. I wanna take a brief moment to introduce our three panelists, Sarah Klein, Professor Paul Cassell, and Anna Rossi, who bring with them a breadth of knowledge and experience on the topic of these issues. Our first panelist is Sarah Klein. She is a survivor of sexual abuse, a current lawyer, and a former competitive gymnast. Sarah is one of the first known survivors of Larry Nasser and one of the many brave women who came forward and exposed him for his heinous crimes. She currently works as an attorney and is an active advocate for victims of sexual abuse and offers a unique perspective through her own lived experiences and her knowledge of the law. Second, we will have Professor Paul Cassell, who is a former district judge of the United States District Court for the District of Utah. He is a leading spokesperson for the protection of criminal right, victims' rights and has supported victims from cases including Oklahoma City bombing to more recently the victims in the ongoing lawsuit against Jeffrey Epstein. Third, we will have Anna Rossi, who has spent much of her career as a felony prosecutor, has spent time as a justice court judge appointed to the South Salt Lake City Justice Court, and now works as the deputy district attorney for Salt Lake County. I encourage everyone in the audience to please look up all of our panelists to learn more about their extensive work as these short summaries do little justice to the ongoing incredible and essential actions that they are taking in order to pursue this issue. With that, I'm excited by the breadth and experience, expertise and perspective on this panel. And it is an immense honor to welcome our panelists. With that, I will welcome Sarah to begin and we will begin our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm sitting here laughing to myself that I'm even on this panel. How did I get here? Um, because number one, you know, Paul and Anna, I, you know, have, have looked at your work and Paul, I can't say what a big, huge fan of the work you've done um, that I am. And also I'm laughing because I'm not a criminal lawyer and I, and I don't know that much about criminal law um, other than, you know, what I learned in, in law school and probably got like, you know, a C or something. Um, but I do know sort of from firsthand experience, having gone through um, the sentencing of of Larry Nassar myself. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. So just for starters, um, thank you so much for having me. I, I never know why I get invited to do this stuff. I'm way out of my league here, but um, I'll tell you, listening to John um, this morning and to Tiffany, who is a dear, dear friend of mine, um, was really breathtaking and for a living, I listen to stories of abuse and I listen to the pain in the survivors' voices and, and, you know, the aftermath of what these people have gone through. But I was, again, just wildly touched and impressed with the beauty, with the love, with the tenderness 
with which these two remarkable people shared their stories with us. And, you know, I've heard Tiffany speak um, so many times and, you know, it, it's just as raw and just as vulnerable and, and just as touching every time she speaks. So John Vaughn, I hope you're listening and I hope our paths will cross someday. I'm so proud of you. And it's an honor, you know, to know that I have a brother survivor out there like you and um, Tiffany, you know, I love you always. So um, I am a civil lawyer um, representing survivors of sexual abuse. And the way I happened into this career um, was through going through 17 years of abuse at the hands of Larry Nassar. I, I somewhere along the way picked up, you know, sort of the victim number one thing. Um, I, it's believed that I was sort of his first victim at eight years old and um, someone whom he practiced on uh, very regularly several times a week. Um, for the following 17 years. And at 25 years old, I was an Ivy League graduate, a first year law student, and still going back to Larry Nassar for treatment, because as Tiffany mentioned, the love was real. And, um, and this was somebody I knew my whole life, I loved and trusted, and would never have believed that what he was doing was for his own sexual pleasure. Um, you know, both both Tiffany and John sort of touched on the fact that that what you're carrying when you're living as a survivor of sexual abuse is a very, very heavy load. And for me, that looked like depression, anxiety, suicide attempts, um, the the belief the firm belief, the conviction that I was one of those souls that just wasn't meant for this world, that there was something wrong with me, I, that I wasn't supposed to be here, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Because again, in my mind, Larry was a loved and trusted figure in my life. Um, my life began to decline. So I have all these credentials and I, you know, went to these fancy schools, but I could never really hack it in life. I couldn't really, um, you know, be in the world without, without the burden of massive anxiety, self-doubt, low, you know, low confidence, et cetera. And it got to the point where for seven years, um, uh, I couldn't really leave my house. I, I couldn't get to Rite Aid to pick up a prescription because the anxiety was, was so real and so strong. And, and I just began retreating. Um, enter, you know, what you all watched play out in, in the news, which is the criminal proceedings against Larry Nassar, the arrest um, and the criminal proceedings. And for me, that was the turning point in my life. It was a, a catalytic moment. Um, my co-panelist, um, Professor Cassell, is, is talking today a bit about victim impact statements, um, which I'm so glad that he's doing. I gave my victim impact statement on day one of Nasser's sentencing. Um, I was the last person to go, and that very first day, there was only a finite number of us that had signed up to do this victim impact statement thing. And as you saw, the momentum built and built, and it was women standing on the shoulders of other women to sharing our truths and, and, you know, and, and taking our, our power back in a way that captivated, captivated the country and, and the world. I chose to be a Jane Doe on that day. So my victim impact statement is, is online, but it's just my voice. And that was a personal decision just because Larry, Larry was such a personal part of my life. I needed that moment to be between he and I, and I wasn't ready for that to be um, shared with, with the rest of the country. And, and also, you know, there's, there's this person sitting four feet away um, that's about to go to prison for the, the rest of his life. And, and my, 
the the whole paradigm of my life had just exploded, right? Everything I thought I knew. And, and John and Tiffany so beautifully touched on, you know, the institutions we thought were safe, the, the institutions we thought we loved. I didn't attend Michigan State, but I grew up in East Lansing. We learned the fight song in elementary school. Like this was a college town. We loved this university. Um, and we loved of USA Gymnastics. Um, and so, you know, the paradigm of your life explodes and we are sort of thrust into the spotlight. And, um, and I'll say, you know, that was where I sort of began to wear these two hats. We filed civil lawsuits suits. And I'll, I'll say that there is this notion um, that uneducated people have that civil lawsuits are money grabs, right? You file a civil lawsuit because then we can get some money and, you know, all will be well. Um, absolutely not. And what I tell my clients is the criminal process is meant to get this predator off the streets so that they can never ever harm another person and another child ever again. So we're looking at guilty or innocent. The civil process is part two. It's how the hell did this massacre happen? How the hell did this man get away with this for 30 plus years and Everybody around him turned a blind eye, covered up, buried their head in the sand, and when faced with the difficult decision, did the wrong thing and chose the easy route. And, and that's what the civil process, in my view, having been a client in the civil process and now being a lawyer in the civil process is about. It's about how how, who knew what, when, who was there, who saw things, who knew, and what in the world were they thinking? And so I recognize this is a criminal law. This is a criminal law panel. So I'm saying, how could I sort of marry the two? But I think, you know, I think it's really exactly that. It's a, it's a marriage, at least in our case, it was a marriage. And in, in the process, and thanks to things like Marcy's Law, um, which, you know, Professor Cassell, you know, wrote the book on, um, there, there can be this marriage where, you know, our civil lawyers could have a beautiful relationship with our prosecutor and share knowledge and help each other other and support each other. Um, and so as a civil lawyer, I am oftentimes working with the criminal team, with the FBI, um, with the U.S. Attorney's Office in order to, number one, get this person off the streets, and number two, understand how. And so I think it's a really beautiful thing when these two things work together. Um, they don't always work together, right? There, there are people on the criminal side, you know, that that are suspect of the civil side, or people on the civil side that aren't doing anything, you know, to help with the criminal side. But in our experience, we had a perfect marriage of the two, and I believe that that made all the difference. Um, how a survivor is treated at the point of disclosure is critical. I cannot stress that enough. There's science behind that, there's psychology behind that, but there's also just the basics of the human spirit, right? How, how somebody is met at that point of disclosure is everything. And I would argue um, that it can dictate sort of whether that person can ever can ever heal and move forward with their life or not. Um, and so um, being in this role now, um, I and I have stepped into this role in a way because I now get to be that person for my clients that I so very much needed when I was, 
homebound, unable to go to Rite Aid, terrified, and about to face my abuser slash loved one, you know, in a court of law, right? And, and to be walked through both the criminal process and the civil process um, by people who deeply cared um, about our stories, about our truths, made all the difference for me. And, and it gave me the permission to step into my adult life, right? To step into this next stage of my life where I now have the absolute honor, honor to walk other survivors through what could be an otherwise very arduous process. Um, the the civil process, and, and I think for the criminal process, you, you can say the very same thing. It is about taking your power back. Um, it is about, you know, being able to um, give what happened to you some meaning. And the most frustrating part about my job is the cover-ups, right? The entity defendants who are going to fight like hell to deny, 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 and to, you know, lie and, you know, hire their own outside law firms to independently investigate themselves and then never release independent investigations. Um, the reason we got a $500 million settlement in Nassar wasn't because, you know, Michigan State was stepping up and doing the right thing. Um, and they felt bad and wanted to compensate us for all the years of therapy and treatment and all of the things that a survivor might need. Um, the reason they wrote a $500 million check was because they knew that what they did was horrifying. They would never say that, so they would rather pay the money and and move on. They have still never really acknowledged uh, what what transpired there. Um, but the 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 cover ups by the entity defendants. When you listen to John and you listen to Tiffany this morning, you know they talked about the actual act of abuse. They talked about the impacts that had on them. But, but what I heard from both of them, the real heartbreak came from the place of the, the place I loved, the people I loved at these universities failed me and continue to fail me by not stepping up and, and allowing any transparency, any answers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have a couple of minutes left, but I want to just talk about statute of limitations for a second. Um, laws are archaic, right, when it comes to these issues. And, and we're seeing that everywhere. And, and people like Professor Cassell are doing, you know, committing their life's work to changing that. And, and I so admire that. But laws are archaic right now. For, and they are very, very pro perpetrator and pro-entity and pro-defendant. Um, and so part of my work has been getting out there in, in lobbying and testifying and talking as much as I can about making sure that all survivors are getting access to the courts at, at whatever time in their lives they're able to pursue that for themselves. And so the average age of, of disclosing child sex abuse is 52 years old. Um, there's shame, there's all sorts of reasons for that. But, you know, I think part of our work together as a community interested in these topics is, is making sure we're not just having the conversation and then going back to, to our merry lives, but we're having the conversation and we're getting out there and we're making change so that, you know, the John Vaughns of the world can have access to the court at 50 years old, right? And Michigan has bad law. We were able to, to get a statute passed just for Nassar and Michigan, but 
that that's something I'm committing my work and my life to. I have um, a case in, in central Pennsylvania right now, a pediatrician pedophile case. I have a hundred clients in that case, more coming forward every day. 50% of the clients are over the age of 30. 50% of the clients are under the age of 30. My out of statute clients, my clients that are 30 years old or older have absolutely no recourse. My client who's 29 years old has recourse. How does that make sense, right? So, so part of our jobs I think as a community is to take this conversation um, and keep going. Very last thing I'll finish with is back to my point that civil and criminal um, law, there's a, there can be a beautiful marriage between the two. We have seen over and over criminal convictions born out of the civil process. We saw that in Nasser. We saw Kathy Clagus be charged. Um, you know, after the civil process had transpired because there was more information that came to light. Um, and so I see that in a lot of my cases. And so I think it's just, again, very critical that all of this work together, not only, you know, for, you know, simplicity purposes or not only because it's intuitive that they work together, but it because it is the best thing for the survivor. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. And again, I'm just really honored to be here and I'm excited to see what my co-panelists have to present. Thank you so much. Perfect, thank you so much. And with that, we'll pass it over to Professor Paul Cassell. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to try to share my uh, screen here, which I hope uh, hope will succeed. I've got uh, uh, some information here that hopefully everyone is seeing uh, about uh, victim impact statements by Dr. Uh, Larry Nasser's uh, victims. Um, it's an honor for me uh, to follow uh, Ms. Klein, uh, victim number one, although actually uh, maybe it's a testament to the uh, impersonalness of our criminal justice system there. I've seen media references to her as victim number 125. So our system, I think, has a long way to go in terms of recognizing individual victims. Also pleased to be on the panel with uh, Deputy District Attorney Rossi, who's handled uh, complex cases like this one and, and uh, I know is going to have some interesting uh, comments to make as well. What I want to talk about is these victim impact statements that Ms. Klein referred to as a catalytic uh, moment in her life. And I think you'll see as we kind of work through some of the things about victim impact statements, why that might be the case. And I'm going to uh, argue uh, briefly that we need to be as a society, as, a crim as uh, those who may have some ability to shape our criminal justice systems, we need to be making those opportunities more readily available and meaningful for victims of crime. Let me um, begin uh, my presentation by talking about, uh, here we have, uh, I think you might have seen some of the memes that went around a couple of years ago when the victim impact statements were being given. Uh, Judge Aquilina is here uh, on the left, uh, and some of the victims who gave victim impact statements are, are there on the right. Uh, and I think the general consensus around the country was that this was a very useful thing to see our criminal justice system uh, doing. But of course, there are always those who seem to want to try to find some problem with common sense. Uh, and so what I have on this slide here is, I guess we have a defense attorney, Rachel March, uh, Marshall, who is saying that Judge Aquilina was, uh, you know, transgressing the boundaries between judge and advocate. Uh, Another defense attorney uh, saying that Judge Aquilina somehow departed from her judicial role because she was uh, disgusted with this uh, multiple pedophile. Um, and then another, uh, I guess, former attorney, Andrew Cohen, saying that uh, she wasn't an impartial arbiter and uh, became uh, uh, somehow biased by showing hostility and anger, again, towards a man who had sexually abused, uh, uh, obviously, more than 100 uh, girls and women. Is it really violating the rules? I would argue, in fact, I did argue at the time that Judge Aquilina was behaving as we would want uh, a good judge to behave. Um, 
I think those who were criticizing Judge, uh, Judge Aquilina for the way she was handling uh, those victim impact statements misunderstand how our criminal justice system works and uh, what sorts of things uh, uh, we should be uh, trying to do during sentencing of a criminal defendant, a defendant who, let's remember, at the sentencing phase has been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of, in this case, horrific crimes against more than 100 girls and women. There's nothing wrong with hearing from victims in this setting. In fact, uh, as Ms. Klein mentioned, uh, Marcy's Law and other uh, uh, victims' rights initiatives in Michigan and around the country have enshrined in state constitutions and state statutes the right of a victim to make a statement to the court at sentencing. So I think we're beginning now, I think all 50 states recognize the right to give a victim impact statement. And in the process of giving that victim impact statement, how is a judge supposed to uh, respond? Well, it's clear if you look at, for example, a Michigan Court of Appeals case, that judges are entitled to hear from a victim of crime. That's a valid sentencing consideration. Indeed, there is explicit consideration of hearing from victims. Uh, simply having the judge consider the impact on the crime, that doesn't amount to prejudice. After all, what is a sentence supposed to do? The sentence uh, is supposed to take the gravity of the crime and the impact of the crime, maybe the defendant's culpability for that crime, and blend all those things together to reach an appropriate outcome. How can a judge do that if the judge does not hear from victims? And in the course of hearing from victims about what this guilty defendant uh, has done, um, this is according to our United States Supreme Court, well, a judge may become exceedingly ill-disposed towards the defendant, um, who is shown to be a thoroughly reprehensible person. Impartiality is not gullibility. Uh, did we expect Judge Aquilina to sit there and say, well, my goodness, who knew? Or did we expect her to do something else? Uh, in fact, I would, ex uh, I would suggest, uh, suggest, and the Michigan Court of Appeals has suggested that, in fact, sentencing is the time for comments against felonious, antisocial behavior recounted and unraveled before the eyes of the sentencer. The law is to be vindicated and the grievance of, the, of society and the victim redressed. The language of punishment need not be tepid. So I think when you look at that backdrop, what Judge Aquilina did was entirely appropriate and uh, indeed was to be commended. I guess this also raises a broader question of what, uh, when women are coming forward to speak to Judge Aquilina or any victims speaking to judges around the country, what is it that we're hoping that those victim impact statements will accomplish? And I've written a law review article on that. Let me just kind of run through what I think are sort of the standard accepted grounds for a victim impact statement. As we were just discussing, uh, one obvious ground would be to provide information to the sentencer. Let the punishment, punishment fit the crime. Well, what was the crime? Who better to say what the crime was than the victim of that crime? Uh, there also may be benefits to victims, and Ms. Klein was mentioning that when she said this was a catalytic moment in her life. Uh, uh, let's be clear, I mean, just the fact that someone gets to speak to a judge doesn't make everything all hunky-dory, but it does, I think, provide perhaps in some cases, and this is going to vary from individual to individual, some measure of closure, some opportunity to maybe put the events in a rear view, a rear view mirror to some degree, and so there may be cathartic benefits for victims that come from delivering victim impact statements. Uh, this may also be an opportunity to explain to the defendant what he has done, because we want the defendant to understand the full measure of the crime he's committed and the impact it's had on society. Maybe that leads to some kind of rehabilitation. Maybe that leads to some kind of reformation. I don't know uh, that we're naive enough to think that is going to always or even often happen. But we do hope that it might happen to some degree and a victim impact statement may be useful in that way. And it may also improve the perceived fairness of sentencing. I think people around the country looked at uh, Larry Nasser's sentencing and said, well, he got his say, but so did the victims and the judge made a decision. That's the way the system ought to work. And that is a system that is fairer because all those who are involved got a chance to be heard. So against that backdrop, what do we know about victim impact statements? What does the existing research show? 
And I think it's fair to say there's very limited research on victim impact statements. Most of that research has been on, well, does the judge give a longer sentence or does the jury cut somebody a break? How does, how does that all work? Really very little information about uh, what's in the victim impact statement. And so it's difficult to say uh, what a victim impact statement typically includes or excludes uh, because we don't know a lot about it. And then again, uh, the crimes may vary. We may have a sex assault crime in one case, uh, maybe a victim's family is speaking in a homicide case, maybe there's a fraud case. Uh, so we don't know much about victim impact statements. Against that backdrop, I thought it might be very useful to study this case and use the Nasser sentencing as a research area. Uh, and I have a picture here of some of the victims who were giving impact statements. Um, in fact, as, uh, as you've learned today, 150 victims spoke and they were all subject to, I don't wanna oversimplify here, but roughly similar abuse, certainly abuse from the same, same individual. And so do victims who have experienced similar crimes deliver similar victim impact statements? Uh, my working hypothesis when I got involved with this project, uh, along with a colleague, uh, Professor Edna Ares at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and, and her associate, Casey Harris, we thought, well, look, I, we, our assumption is we're going to find that victims experience victimization in different ways as individuals, and they all have unique and differentiated things to say in their victim impact statement. And so what we've been doing for the last, uh, I guess, year or so now is we took those 150 victim impact statements, which were all recorded. Uh, they've all been transcribed now by a, a court reporter, and we've been able to go through the words that were spoken and try to see what uh, the victims were saying, these 150 victims. So this is very preliminary right now. We've just been starting to catalog our data recently, but let me share with you a few things that we've learned so far about this case. One thing that was interesting is uh, who spoke and delivered the victim impact statement. Uh, and you see here out of the 150 victims, about 100 where the direct victim, Ms. Klein or others, were uh, uh, spoke and delivered the victim impact statement. Sometimes there was a representative of the victim, maybe a friend or family member who uh, spoke because perhaps the victim didn't feel capable of speaking for herself. Sometimes secondary uh, victims, other family members or others who were affected by the crime uh, spoke as well. We also uh, found something, this was kind of interesting. I had seen this uh, in some of the cases I'd worked on where victims would, uh, would put up a picture to, uh, to demonstrate a particular point. In this case, for example, to show how young uh, looking uh, some of the victims were at the time uh, the sexual abuse occurred. And here more than I think half of the victims uh, presented a picture. We, we didn't have some data in other cases and there were a few other scenarios as well. But I guess one of the things we learned in this case is uh, presenting a picture is a common way of driving home the impact of a crime or maybe uh, describing uh, how vulnerable uh, and young appearing uh, some of the victims were at the time that Nasser decided to sexually abuse them. Now, here's another point. This is one that uh, Ms. Klein mentioned uh, was her experience when she delivered her victim impact statement. She referred to that moment between herself and Nasser. Um, is that, uh, was that unusual to her or was that uh, something that was common among all the victims? And again, we were, we were just looking at the text of these various victim impact statements. Uh, so uh, maybe we missed uh, some eye contact or something like that. But looking at the text of the victim impact statements, uh, about two thirds, uh, we could be, uh, we could tell from the text of the victim impact statements, tried to speak directly to the defendant. And again, that can have, uh, that can have two benefits. One is it may be beneficial for the victim to be able to directly address her abuser. And it may also be, we would hope, of some measure of benefit, again, I don't want to overstate this, to the defendant who now begins to understand exactly uh, what he has done. Did the uh, victim describe sexual abuse during the victim impact statement? And here again, uh, close to two thirds described the sexual abuse. This may seem at, at some level pretty obvious, uh, but at another level, remember our, our first uh, purpose behind a victim impact statement is to provide information to the judge about the crime. And to be sure, uh, Judge Aquilina had other information. I'm sure the probation office had put together a report and there was some indictments or something that described what happened. But 
uh, to hear the full measure of the crime and exactly what was done and how it uh, how it was accomplished. That would be useful information to a judge who's determining uh, what sentence uh, to impose. And uh, carrying on that particular point, here again we see that about two-thirds of the victims described the tactics of abuse while they were delivering the impact uh, victim impact statement. And here again, this could be very useful information to a judge, uh, as Ms. Klein and, and others have uh, mentioned uh, today. Typically what we see in these kinds of cases is very sophisticated pattern, uh, a very sophisticated pattern of behavior. Uh, grooming victims, grooming family members, maybe even uh, grooming others who uh, might be in a position to uncover what's going on. All of that uh, would be very helpful information to a judge in imposing a, a sentence, and, and we see a large number of victims uh, had done that. What about the healing or therapeutic qualities of a victim impact statement? Uh, Ms. Klein mentioned the therapeutic, uh, or I'm sorry, catalytic moment that the victim impact statement was for her. Um, and she was not alone in experiencing that. Uh, in our data, uh, looking at the 150 statements, we saw that about 40%, 60 out of the 150, referenced specifically during their statement that they had found this to be a useful process for them to go through. I don't think that means the others found it uh, unhelpful or something like that. Maybe they just didn't mention that. But again, that we can see significant evidence that, that a, a significant fraction of the victims uh, felt that this was uh, something that was important to them uh, to have done. Uh, another thing you might wonder about is sometimes people say, well, victims should forgive and forget or whatever. Did that really occur in this case? I, I'm not sure I subscribe to the view that victims should forgive. I'm not sure that I disagree. I, I think that each victim should uh, do whatever he or she uh, wishes to do. And what we see here is that uh, some victims referred to forgiveness. Most victims, however, did not. Uh, and those who were referring to it sometimes were making unfavorable references. So uh, again, some information about, I guess, the uniqueness of victim impact statements and the way that victims experience it. And uh, I think I, this is about my last slide, give or take here. Uh, this is something that Ms. Klein referred to as well, uh, that there were sort of victims that came forward on the first day and then others started standing on their shoulders and others and soon the sisterhood of victims uh, came forward to the point where there were 150 uh, victims that uh, felt that they were in a position to deliver an oral statement with the eyes of the nation watching, with the cameras rolling and with people paying some attention. Um, that was not, uh, she was not alone in experiencing that sisterhood of victimization. 125 out of the 150 women that spoke made a specific reference to the other victims and, and how they were mutually uh, supportive. So we have a lot more data that we're looking at and you may have some other questions to ask, but in conclusion, uh, the conclusion I draw from this data is that we should strengthen the crime victim's role in our criminal justice process. We should be giving voice to victims where it's appropriate, such as in sentencing, and we should be listening to those voices, and we should be doing just as Judge, uh, Judge Aquilina did when she sentenced uh, Dr. Nasser uh, several years ago. Thank you so much, Professor Cassell. With that, we will move on to our third and final panelist. Um, and then we will open to discussion. Just a reminder, everyone, to please share any questions and we will get to those in discussion. And with that, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Michael. And thank you everyone um, for having me here today to, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, Sarah, you're not the only one that feels out of their league when you're on the same space as Professor Cassell. Um, he is a, a hero and a champion for women and victims in this country and frankly all over the world. And um, I'm very honored to have my name next to his on even just a slide introducing, <laughs> introducing a panel. Um, Sarah, I also want to thank you. I've never heard your story before, your individual story. And um, it's you're the reason that we have this conversation at all, right? You, stories like yours and people like you. And you um, may be, you know, you may be a civil attorney, but even just in the, the 15 minutes that you spoke, I made a note to myself, should we start calling civil lawyers as witnesses in our trials? Because you, you, the way you explain the reason the, the side of this or the civil side of things is really important for juries to understand and for people to understand. And so even just through conversations like this, we learn from you. So thank you for being here and for sharing um, your side of this. 
Um, I want to kind of start by explaining to everybody how I find myself in this seat today. I, um, I am a prosecutor. I've been a prosecutor since 2003 um, for pretty much my entire career. And um, I've spent most of that time prosecuting sex offenses. Um, I started um, back in my hometown in Illinois, and my mentor there was the sex offense prosecutor in my small county, and so kind of got interested and in, 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 um, into those cases through him and involved in those sorts of prosecutions. When I moved here to Utah in 2012, I started with the DA's office and um, was in a couple of other units for a year or two and then moved into special victims. And it was actually Professor Cassell's wife who hired me into my job when, um, when she still worked here back then. And throughout those first few years, I got to know Professor Cassell and his family really, really well. And at some point, um, found myself at a victim's rights conference in Portland where Professor Cassell was a speaker and a presenter there. And the thing that struck me, and we talk about this still to this day, this was probably in 2013 or 14. The thing that struck me then was the idea that prosecutors are oftentimes viewed as the kind of biggest obstruction to victims' rights in the United States. And I was there because I thought there would be a lot of prosecutors there who were you know, interested in victims' rights and wanted to be a part of this conversation, but there were not. The, the, these are victims' rights advocates and victims and um, educators, but there were not a lot of prosecutors there. And I came to realize that we needed to maybe have some different conversations on our end as to how to how to work with victims and how to treat victims and ensure that their rights are protected. So um, that was really impactful on me and Professor Excel and I have had several conversations over the years about victims' rights and what that means and what that should look like. And so I took a couple of years uh, break from prosecution and I'm back at the DA's office now and I oversee the division that houses our family and sexual violence team. And a couple of months ago, I got a phone call from somebody at the Bar Journal asking me to write a book review of Professor Guerrero's book, Armies of Enablers. And so I did that and then was contacted to participate in this panel. So what I kind of want to do today is talk about a few parts of the conversation about the criminalization of enabling behavior um, that aren't addressed, um, aren't addressed to the extent that they probably could be in, um, in Professor Guerrero's book, only because his book is not about that. His this book is clearly um, a persuasive piece educating people on the need for legislation criminalizing enabler, enabling behavior. And he definitely mentions a few other things that are side conversations, but those were kind of the things that came to my mind as I was reading the book as things we should also start to talk about. So having read um, through a lot of other states' bystander legis legislation and things of that nature, it was really interesting to read words by the actual brain behind those types of legislation in Professor Giro's book. Um, he, like hopefully every other human being in the world, believes that people who enable sexual abuse should face consequences. And the justification for those consequences in his book is the are, the, are these survivor stories, are the stories of people who have survived this abuse and, and hope to see these enabling um, individuals brought to justice. There's a couple of things, like I said, that are brought up in the book that I'd like to touch on today. And I kind of want to start with um, the bigger picture side of it and the things that are a little bit more abstract and harder to fix, for lack of a better term. Um, so I want to start by talking a little bit about just societal issues in general. Um, and, he, and Professor Giroa does bring this up in his book as kind of this culture of silence surrounding sex offenses. And it seems um, generally accepted that women and children and frankly, men, all, all victims, survivors of sex abuse, historically have been told to kind of keep quiet and move on after they're sexually assaulted. In working with survivors over the past two decades, um, especially those whose reports of sexual abuse are delayed by a couple days, a couple months, a couple years, by decades, depending on the situation, um, it's a nearly universal truth that survivors experience some level of shame and guilt and that they debate whether to report their, their offender. And that's a problem. It, it, it's a problem for us as a society that abusers through centuries and centuries of oppression of women and through generations of forced silence on our children are protected by this stigma that has been built into our society. Um, in my, in my experience, and I'm sure the experience of Sarah and every survivor out there and every prosecutor out there, um, survivors of sexual abuse will be called liars. 
they will be called quote unquote full of regret. They will be called um, or they'll be told that they don't remember what happened because they quote unquote got themselves too drunk. They will be blamed for everything under the sun when they come forward with these allegations. And it's not only the survivors that will be told that. It's juries and it's judges and it's the media. So this is a this is a widespread issue that reaches anyone who would pay attention to these sorts of cases. And I mean, frankly, forget about it if the offender is a is a white male of financial means. It, it shouldn't take dozens or hundreds of victims for somebody like Harvey Weinstein or Jeffrey Epstein to be brought or Larry Nassar to be brought to justice. It should, that justice should occur after the first offense with the first victim, the only offense with the only victim. So those conversations about how we can talk to our children and empower boys and girls and women and men to speak openly about sex and their bodies and sexual abuse, that is obviously something that I don't have an answer to. Probably no one, no single person has an answer to that issue. But um, in order to find it, we have to work through and against the centuries of the centuries of silencing survivors that have occurred already. Um, to kind of narrow that focus a little bit to the next topic that I wanted to cover, <clears throat> I wanted to discuss uh, criminal justice reform a little bit. As far as prosecutors go, um, I think I'm on the more progressive side of the aisle when it comes to conversations about criminal justice reform. I've spent a fair amount of time over the past years um, trying to educate myself, but mostly being educated by others about the issues that exist in our criminal justice system um, surrounding mass incarceration, disproportionate sentencing based on race or other demographics, and um, mandatory sentencing, things like that. And while we're obviously not talking about the same demographics in this particular conversation about enablers that we normally do in cr criminal justice reform conversations, it's still an important part of it, and specifically the movement to kind of steer away from further incarceration and further criminalization of more and more individuals. And I wanted to use kind of the, um, the college admission scandal as an example here. So in, in that particular conversation, um, you know, we're seeing, especially on Twitter or social media, people who are getting really upset because the, the offenders in the col college admission scandal who are generally very wealthy white people are only being sentenced to you know, 90 days or 100 days in jail, a few months in jail, where people of color or poor people or poor people of color who are convicted of much lower level offenses are serving years of incarceration. And the thing that um, my, progress my very progressive friends and family members have educated me on is that the conversation shouldn't be these wealthy white people should serve more jail time to match them up with these poor people of color. It's that everybody should serve less jail time. The, the conversation is surrounding let's let's spend less time incarcerating people and more time working on root causes. But you know, for for those root causes in the in the conversation about um, general in general terms about mass incarceration, we're talking about addiction and mental health issues and things that you know incarceration may not deter. Whereas with enablers, we're talking about other root causes. We're talking about greed. We're talking about narcissism. Who knows what is causing these people to not report the offenses that, that are brought to their attention. So it is very possible that, um, that incarceration could deter that behavior. And when we look at some examples from Professor Giro's book, as far as where these people are, um, you know, Kathy Clages, I'm just looking at a couple of notes. Kathy Clages from MSU, from Michigan State, was sentenced to 90 days in jail. Um, we had Joe Paterno from Penn State who was fired, but he died a couple of months after he got fired and was never charged with anything. Um, Steve Penny from USA Gymnastics was removed. He's been charged. He's awaiting trial and he's on USAG's permanently ineligible list. And I'm not really sure what that entails, but he can't ever work in gymnastics again. And then um, as Sarah mentioned, civil settlements are, are a common thread here as well. So I guess the question is, is that going to be enough for survivors? And it probably depends on who you ask. Um, as Professor Cassell pointed out, survivors um, are all different and they all look for different things. So um, I guess it depends on the survivor and whether civil suit is going to be enough or 90 days in jail is going to be enough or what they're looking for. But um, on the criminal justice reform side, we certainly don't have to take that incarceration off the table. We just have to talk about what else might work. And the last thing that I wanted to touch on is um, the idea that uh, there's a resource issue here. And this is a very selfish um, selfish concern and one that's probably easily fixable. But um, 
prosecutions like this, these large scale prosecutions, they take a lot of time and they take a lot of resources. And for, I, I went to the University of Illinois for undergrad and in a town like that in Champaign, Illinois, with a university that you know has 45,000 students at it, if we have a large scale prosecution of dozens of individuals potentially, they're gonna need some help with that. They're not going to be able to do that within their own prosecution office. So um, th that sort of, uh, that sort of thing needs to be addressed in the legislation probably and um, and funds provided through either the state or feds or something to address that issue if and when it arises. Um, I think I'm about out of time. So I just kind of wanted to wrap up. I um, One of the things you said, Sarah, really, uh, really kind of struck me early on. Um, Professor Giro points out in his book that we have a responsibility to each other as humans. And, and we know that. But Sarah, when you said um, earlier that you know, these people, these enablers were faced with, you said they're faced with a difficult decision and did the easy thing. And that is heartbreaking to me because this should not be a difficult decision. It should not be a difficult decision for an adult to have to learn of the sexual abuse of a child or a young adult and to do something about it. That's not a difficult decision. That's an easy decision. The easy thing is to do something. And the problem that we're facing is that there are so many people who see it differently. And that's the conversation, that's a reason that we have this conversation is to figure out what to do to get everyone to see that the easy thing is to help these victims and these survivors. So Sarah, thank you so much again for, for telling your story and for being here. And Professor Cassell, thank you for um, inviting me along and having me here. And I think um, that my time is up. I may have gone over, I apologize, Michael, but um, I think, We'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. No, perfect. Um, thank you to all three of you uh, just for shedding light and sharing your expertise on these topics regarding victims, victims' rights and law. Um, you guys covered a nice range of topics from the statutes, um, victim statements, and then just a nice overview of the book and understanding it from a number of different places and putting it into context. Um, with that, uh, the I just wanna remind the audience that the Q&A is open and available. Um, we have a number of questions that we will start working our way through, um, but invite anyone who has additional questions to please add them to the chat um, and we will work our way from the top to the bottom. Um, with that, I'm going to read the first question um, and it asks, how would you recommend or guide other attorneys approaching confidentiality and non-disparagement provisions and settlements for sex abuse cases to ensure societal change and survivors who settle can keep advocating. I'll open that to any of the three of you and give you a chance to think about it. I think I can answer um, that one. So our position on that, and I think the, the right position on that is there should be absolutely no confidentiality provisions in any sort of a settlement um, or any kind of an NDA. If um, an entity defendant uh, through the process of mediation asks for that from our clients, we say, see you at trial. Um, not happening, no way, no how. Why? Because we will never, ever silence the voice of the victim ever again. They have been silenced. Um, they, their voice was taken from them at some point in their life, even if they're an adult victim, right? Um, and so we don't do confidentiality. We don't do NDAs. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think from um, an ethical standpoint, it's, it's a positive thing for um, the survivor. And, and we say to our clients, this process is about healing. You, you should leave this process um, better than how we found you at the beginning of the process and taking that power back and you getting to be the one in charge um, and, and holding these, these enablers and, and 
perpetrators to account. So if you are then saying, but we can't tell anybody about it or, but we are going to still protect, you know, Michigan state, right. That defeats the purpose. It defeats the purpose. And so we, you know, different firms have different stances on this. I know a lot of other civil lawyers in my field that do NDAs and, you know, do, you know, do confidential settlements, but you will never see that from my firm and, and I don't believe in it. Thank you. Um, another question that might go to you, Sarah. Um, the question reads, if the average age of disclosure is 52, why aren't criminal statute of limitations aligned with that? For example, New York State just raised the criminal statute of limitations to 28. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. If I knew the answer to that, right, then, then the, you know, it, it's, it's arbitrary. I don't, I have, I have no idea. Um, I, I don't know if Anna knows more about that um, in terms of criminal statutes than I do. But I think that's a great question. I completely agree. No, and I, I don't really have um, an answer for it either, Sarah. I do know, I mean, I've practiced in DC and Detroit and Illinois and now Salt Lake, Salt Lake County and everybody has different statutes and they change all the time and they some of them are retroactive and some of them aren't. It's completely arbitrary and it, it's definitely an issue across the board. And to take it one step further, can you guys help share or provide a little understanding of how potentially we can shift that age um, or change the limitations. Let me uh, weigh in on that just briefly, uh, and then I'm sure that others will have some thoughts as well. There's an excellent resource on the internet uh, that's run by uh, Professor uh, uh, Marcy Hamilton. It's called uh, SOL for Statue of Limitations Reform. Um, and so if you look for SLL, I'm sorry, sol-reform.com, uh, she has resources on literally all 50 states there and the efforts, efforts that are being made in various states to try to extend both the criminal and the civil statutes of limitations. And so there is a robust effort going on around the country uh, and where we are having some success. Uh, you're starting to see statutes of limitations extended, uh, but uh, the, I, I think there's always more to be done. It's interesting in my mind, when you think about the statute of limitations on the criminal side for murder, there's a lifetime statute of limitations. And we think, okay, that works. All right, well, maybe we don't need to go lifetime for sexual assault, but that's uh, sexual assault rape is generally regarded as the second most serious crime in the criminal code. So why not go, the federal system has gone 20, 25 years. You know, why aren't we thinking in terms of at least that as sort of a, a, a working uh, a start for our statute of limitations? Um, I'll weigh in on that also. The, um, I work with Marcy Hamilton. I'm on the board of Child U.S. Advocacy. And so the question in terms of how does it get done? Um, essentially, we go state to state and lobby and you know, have meetings and share stories and testify and try to convince, again, um, try to convince adults that this is not a partisan issue, um, that this is, there's sort of a right way to look at this and a wrong way to look at this. Unfortunately, on the civil side, we are met with um, lobbyists and, and you know, very well-funded um, opposition in the form of, you know, people protecting the church and protecting, you know, the entities. And then you say, well, why? Why would they do that? Uh, money. <laughs> it all comes down to money. It all comes down to exposure and money. And so if we can keep the statutes bad, then less people can bring cases and then we won't have to pay them and we can protect our brand and protect our reputation and keep getting people enrolling at Michigan State every year, right? So, so there are bad people protecting the bad guys and that's the opposition we face state to state in terms of um, the civil side. You know, the criminal side, I, I just don't understand, but, um, but hopefully, you know, we're seeing we're seeing things move in somewhat of the right direction. We, we have a long way to go. 
Absolutely. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, the next question is from Gabriel Caruso. Does Salt Lake County give survivors the right to make a victim statement at sentencing when a plea bargain has been reached? And do you speak with survivors before agreeing to a plea? Yes, yes and yes. <laughs> so um, we, we have, uh, I mean, ideally we do, right? As long as we are able to reach a survivor and, um, and speak with them about the case, we absolutely have those conversations. Um, we have a, a new division in our office that's just called Victim Services. It houses all of our counselors and case managers and things like that. And um, the goal of that unit is to, is to bring our survivors even more into the fold when it comes to those decisions and those conversations. Because frankly, when it's just up to prosecutors with the way that court, well, the way court used to go before COVID hit, but the way court goes, it, it goes very quickly and you have hundreds and hundreds of cases and it's, and it's easier for someone to be left out of a conversation that probably should not be left out of a conversation. But um, we're, we're shoring up those processes and procedures. And um, not only do the victims or the, sorry, the survivors have a right to speak at sentencing, um, but we, we more than welcome it. It's a very important part of the process. And even if it is a plea bargain, um, if there's a plea agreement, if there is a sentencing hearing, then the survivor will get to speak at that sentencing hearing if they choose to do so. Thank you, Anna. Um, the next question comes from Annie Knox with Desert News. She asks, what tools do prosecutors have to go after enablers in the criminal world? How widely do they vary from state to state? Hi, Annie. <laughs> I, think, I think that, um, and Professor Cassell might be able to speak to this a little bit more thoroughly than I can, but it's my understanding that in Utah, the, the main um, way that we have to address that here is through our, uh, man, our mandatory reporting law. So people are, are uh, there's a class B misdemeanor offense, I believe, for failing to report um, a sexual offense, like a child sex offense, if you know that one has occurred or if you have knowledge that one has occurred. Um, so that's what we have in Utah. There's also you know, lots of states have obstruction of justice statutes or tampering with witness statutes or tampering with evidence statutes that have been utilized in, um, you know, cases like the Michigan State case or cases where emails are destroyed or, you know, messages are thrown away, um, evidence that this whole thing occurred is covered up. So you can use things like that. There are also states that have bystander laws that say if you become, if anyone becomes aware that an offense is occurring, they're um, required to call 911 to call the authorities and report it. Um, Utah does not yet have that to my knowledge. I think that that's one that Professor Giro is um, working on to get that passed as well. Um, but there's kind of just a gamut of things and depending on what state you're in, they may all be there or you may not have none of them. Yeah, ditto to all of that uh, from, from Anna. Uh, let me just mention one thing on the, the, the bystander point. Uh, Representative King, who spoke this morning, is currently running a bill in our Utah legislature. He's been working with uh, Professor Giora and, and me and others to uh, try to get bystander legislation in. Uh, this uh, legislative session, it's fairly narrowly focused. It's focused in on vulnerable adults and children. So the idea is, look, we could all come together uh, as a state uh, here in Utah to say whatever kind of debates we might have about whether people have to come forward and, and report crimes. When in those two categories, we could have a very robust requirement to report. And then that would be, I think, a, a great deal of help for uh, dealing with uh, these armies of enablers who are out there because they would run afoul of those statutes. Thank you. And could I actually, Michael, could I just plug that part of Professor Giora's book? Because there's a very thorough conversation in the book about those types of legislation. So if anybody has, um, is able to get their hands on the book, he explains it very well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, next question, um, more of uh, a thought, but interested to hear your guys' thoughts around it. Um, they write, probably not a criminal law one, but this conversation has many parallels in trying to figure out a way forward with an army of political enablers turning a blind eye to the false stop the steal narrative and helping get past a moral political self-interest. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, my thought is that there are different realms, I think as our questioner suggests, there are remedies in the political arena 
uh, for uh, people who do things that voters disapprove of, and it's vote them out of office the next time around. Uh, sadly, sexual abuse uh, victims and survivors don't have those kinds of options, and that's why they have to look to a, a criminal justice system for a, a, a robust uh, response. So I guess I'm a little wary of, of conflating the criminal world and crimes with uh, rhetorical uh, excess or other uh, things that are going on in the political arena, because frankly, I don't want uh, prosecutors uh, trying to decide which politicians are telling the truth and which ones aren't. Uh, I figure that's the job of the voters. Thank you. And then um, the question asks, can anyone speak to how to get state attorneys general offices involved if local prosecutors are not supporting survivors or law enforcement officers are engaging in a cover-up? I, I think that, um, again, <laughs> Professor Cassell can probably speak to this um, in a little bit more depth than I can, but I know that we do have legislation in Utah now that allows survivors, if they think that the county attorney's office or the district attorney's office has not done justice in their case, that they've declined it or whatever has been done, they can um, kind of appeal that or re- ask the AG's office to take a look at it. So they can go to the attorney general's office and say, the state declined my case. The DA's office declined my case. Will you please take a look at it and see if you can, um, if you're willing to charge it. And Professor Cassell worked on that. So he can probably speak to that too. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Uh, we have, a, I think, what is a fairly innovative approach here in, in Utah. Uh, in many other states, if the uh, local prosecutor decides the case uh, shouldn't be filed, that's the end of the line. There's no opportunity for further review. I teach a seminar here at the S.J. Quinney College of Law, a little plug for uh, uh, for my school, go Utes. But uh, um, you know, what we talk about in that class is, uh, should there be some kind of a review process? Uh, and it turns out to be a very difficult legal question because we do want, uh, for example, uh, uh, local prosecutors to be accountable to their constituents and to, to essentially make final decisions that they're accountable for. But should there be some kind of review process in extreme cases? The conclusion we came to here in Utah a couple of years ago was, look, for first degree felony cases, uh, which is obviously a very, the very small tip of the pyramid in the criminal justice system, that would be rape and, and similarly uh, serious crimes. If there had been a declination by the local prosecutor, then the victim should have an opportunity uh, if he or she wished to go to the attorney general's office to get a second look at those cases. So we're kind of in the process of getting that funded now, seeing how that's gonna work. Uh, but that is something that's available here in Utah, again, for very serious uh, first degree crimes. Thank you, Professor Cassell. Looks like those are all the questions, but luckily I have plenty of questions. Um, so I actually wanted to go back to what Sarah mentioned when she was talking, she brought up the importance of having these conversations, but more importantly, about what comes after and making change. Um, and it's by chance, I came across a piece that Sarah wrote um, for the Inquirer um, entitled, I lobbied to change the law after I was abused by Larry Nasser. Um, and the title goes on. But my, my question to you, the three of you is, um, how do uh, victim movements and other aspects such as research that Professor Casella is, and what other mechanisms do we have to continue to um, impart change on the legal system? So probably start with Sarah and talk to her um, experiences and lobbying with these large groups and then move to Professor Cassell after that. And then Anna, of course, anything that you might wanna include. Yeah. That's a great question. And, and again, I wish, I wish there was a roadmap, right? I wish there was a roadmap for, for arriving when it comes to this, but I, unfortunately, I, I don't believe um, we will ever reach a point where we have arrived um, unless all statutes are completely lifted. Um, in an ideal world, that's, that's what I would love to see happen, right? Um, I do think what we're seeing with the Me Too movement and NASA is 
um, a much more sort of victim centric, survivor centric model um, where people like our prosecutors and the victim advocates and they are becoming much more trauma informed, um, which goes back to what I said about how you meet the survivor at that point of disclosure can literally impact their spirit um, and sort of make or break them for the rest of their lives. So I love what I've seen in terms of, of things becoming more victim centered um, and victim centric, but um, the answer as to, you know, how, how do we keep affecting change? I think we just keep having these conversations and banging down doors um, until people listen and until, until we, um, until we can get some of this stuff improved upon um, so that, so that, you know, the infrastructure is set up to be pro survivor rather than pro perpetrator or pro institution. Um, so that's my shot at an answer. <laughs> That's a, a great answer. And Sarah mentioned the uh, infrastructure or architecture of our civil and criminal justice systems. I'm sharing a slide, I think, uh, hopefully with everyone. Uh, and this is kind of a fun conceptual so slide that we play around with in my crime victims rights class. So this is uh, an American courtroom, but you'll notice something that's just a little bit different than the way most courtrooms are organized. We have the, the elevated bench for the judge. We have a room for the the jury, the jury room and the jury box. But typically in the courtroom- Just to interrupt for one second, your slide is not showing. All That's right, well, thank you. So uh, I guess I need to hit the share button. How is that looking? Now we can see it, perfect. There we go. Um, you're more ambitious about interrupting me than some of my students who yesterday let me go on for 15 minutes until they noted that my share screen was not operating, but <laughs> here we go with a uh, depiction of a uh, modern uh, American courtroom, the elevated bench for the judge, the uh, jury here uh, in a jury room. But most American courtrooms have two tables, one for the prosecution and one for the defense. I think it's an interesting conceptual exercise to think about what would it look like if we had three tables uh, in every American courtroom, let's say in criminal trials, uh, so that the victim uh, could be more effectively heard and have the victim's interests uh, represented. Interestingly, if you look uh, overseas at Europe and perhaps some other uh, places around the globe, you will see more of a three-sided model than we have here in America. We are sort of the epitome of an adversarial system where I think victims uh, sometimes get overlooked. So I think it might be useful to be thinking about uh, other approaches to the problem. Really interesting. And thanks for uh, helping put that into perspective when we think about the courtroom itself. We have another question for you guys. Um, they write, I'm interested to hear your opinions on the action by certain states where they have created temporary look back windows for people to come forward with sexual assault claims that otherwise would have expired because of the statute of limitations. I think it's brilliant and I think it's necessary. Um, it's, it's, you know, afforded so many amazing, incredible survivors who have carried forth the the trauma of the of their sexual abuse, the opportunity to be able to pursue justice and stand up for themselves and hold um, those who failed them accountable. Um, again, it, when you look at the psychology of the fact that disclosure average age is 52, um, it's really hard. It's really hard to either, you know, admit it to yourself, right, in my case, um, or to be able to find the words and find the voice and find the courage to be able to look it dead in the eye. I think it's human nature psychologically to try to bury trauma um, and to try to bury pain and put it in a box and, um, and try to move forward. But you see very commonly substance abuse issues, anger issues, trust issues, you know, inability to work, inability to 
have relationships. Those are all sort of common manifestations of, of childhood trauma. And so by opening these windows, you're giving these incredible people who have been carrying a thousand pound bricks on their back, a chance to, to, to take that weight right off and, and to be able to, to be able to go there. And, and these windows are finite, right? And so it's not this, you know, going to be this waterfall of, of cases forever, um, which is what defendants are afraid of. But, you know, it, I think it's a, a sort of, it's been a nice, um, middle of the road, you know, sort of uh, solution to um, not wanting to permanently change statutes to where they need to be, but giving people the opportunity. Um, and so I wish more states would do it. And like I mentioned in, in the state of Pennsylvania, you know, my 30, my 30 year old has a case or doesn't have a case. My 29 year old does right? Same pedophile, same, you know, same abuse, et cetera. So I think they're brilliant. I think every state should, should do it. Uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get to stand next to Governor Cuomo as he signed the, the New York Child, Child Victims Act into law. Um, and, you know, California is, has a three-year window right now. Um, I wish more states would do it. And for uh, Mr. Vaughn's purposes, I wish the great old state of Michigan would do it. Just to add a little local uh, information here, we've tried that uh, look back uh, window here in Utah with mixed success. It did open up a, a window for some victims. I represented a couple of victims that were able to take advantage of the window, but our Utah Supreme Court, I think it was about a year ago, said that you couldn't retroactively reopen cases that had uh, lapsed or expired. And so, uh, uh, and sadly, that was a decision based on Utah state constitutional law. And so our Utah Supreme Court has the last word on that subject. So um, just a, a word to advocates out there who are looking at this, take a look at some of the complicated legal issues that, that surround that uh, and try to, to figure out if within your jurisdiction you can, you can make it work. That's the bad news, but the good news is, you know, not the, these look back windows are a good thing, but I think we're having some success around the country in expanding statutes of limitations going forward. So I guess the glass is half empty, but we should also remember that it's half full. Thank you so much. We have a couple more questions. Um, can the panelists speak to how we can ensure the just movement to reduce incarceration and racial discrimination without losing accountability for sexual offenses and violent abusers? Um, I, I think that, um, you know, like I kind of mentioned earlier, I, I think that we have to talk about underlying issues and root causes when we're talking about incarceration. And um, just like with, um, you know, certain types of offenses where, aff where offenders who then reoffend have underlying issues like addiction or mental health. There are some sex offenders who have underlying issues as well. And we kind of just have to start the conversation there as far as what services can be provided, what alternatives to incarceration are out there that can be effective and kind of go from there. Um, I think that in the meantime, we just have to stay on top of everything and hold people accountable to the extent that we can, because, you know, if, we, ha we have a million different conversations in a really broad spectrum. Let's say we have um, an adult rapist who targets adult females, you know, that, and that person has no underlying issues. They just need to be in prison for a really long time. That's, those people are still going to be there, right? And we still have to be able to have those conversations. But um, I think that the goal when we're talking about steering clear of mass incarceration or coming off of mass incarceration is what else is out there that could work. And we just need to talk about those options. Thank you. And from Greg Ardenowski, um, do criminal convictions ever occur after a civil lawsuits are filed? Yes, <laughs> yes, they do. Oftentimes criminal convictions I think are born out of information learned through the civil process. 
So again, you know, we saw charges brought against Luana Simon, president, former president of Michigan State, against Kathy Clagus, um, gymnastics coach. I think we've seen that in a, in a variety of cases. Um, you know, you wish it happened more, but it definitely does. And I think that's part of that marriage between the, the criminal and civil process where if the, if the lines of communication are open, um, there can be really good things um, that, that come from it. Yeah. And I agree, Sarah. And I think that, um, what you did say earlier about, you know, the importance of the civil process. And I kind of mentioned it, but one of the things that we as prosecutors, whenever we, we get a case, uh, especially a case of sexual abuse, and we know that there's a civil case pending, the initial reaction is, oh no, because we know how juries view that, right? They view it as this person's looking for a payday. They're looking for a payout. And with a criminal conviction, it'll be that much easier because the burden of proof is higher. And then the civil suit is just gonna be smooth sailing. But um, I think it's really important for us to be educated as prosecutors and to educate the jurors and to educate anybody involved in that as to your point of view and the importance of this civil suit and what it's actually being done for, that it's not just for the monetary award, it's for a host of other reasons that are much more important. And to continue along that line, I thought it was a really interesting concept that Sarah brought up, this marriage between the civil process and the criminal process. I um, wanted to delve a little bit deeper into thinking about what the future directions look like, both from a civil perspective and from a criminal perspective of how do we, what are our options in terms of protecting victims from both, from both sides and both pieces of those? I think on the criminal side, um, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit trickier, right? Because we don't represent the survivor or the victim in our case. We are not their attorney. We represent the state. Um, and there's this, you know, a, a saying that's out there. It was actually printed on the wall of my first job that said, um, "A the duty of a prosecutor is to do justice, not merely to convict." So we we have a job that entails us protecting the rights of the victims in our cases, but also protecting the rights of defendants in our cases and doing justice. So we can't, we don't have the same um, luxury of, I shouldn't say luxury because it's not a luxury. It's not an easy job. It's a, it's a terribly hard job, but we don't have the same option of saying, I am going to represent this person and everything they want me to do, I'm going to do it. I, they, it is my job like defense attorneys do, you know, they, they get to, they get to do a lot more stuff than we do as prosecutors um, as far as, representing the interests of their client, because our client is the state of Utah and the people of the state of Utah. Um, so we, we can't really represent the interests of crime victims as much as protecting their rights, which is what we're required to do. If that, if that makes sense, it's kind of a fine line, but. And just to weigh in a little bit on what I, you know, we're getting towards the end of the panel. What does the future look like? I think one of the things that we should be thinking about as a country is expanding crime victims' rights. And there is actually, a, you know, a, an interesting uh, trajectory over the last now almost 40 years. Uh, back in 1982, uh, the president appointed a task force on victims of crime, which recommended that there be a federal constitutional amendment that would protect the rights of crime victims just the way we protect the rights of criminal defendants uh, in our constitution. When that first came out, it was kind of a revolutionary idea. What would that look like? And so the victim's rights movement said, let's go to states like Michigan or Utah or others and put into the state constitution a protection for crime victims. And that way we can test language out. We can see what works, what could be improved. And at this point now we have about 38 states that have state constitutional amendments uh, protecting crime victims' rights. About 11 or 12 states, uh, give or take, have recently improved their constitutional protections by enacting a Marcy's Law provision uh, that has comprehensive protections for victims' rights and enforcement mechanisms. So I think we're maybe getting to the point in this country where it might be time to go to the United States Congress, which is where federal constitutional amendments are first presented, and present the case for a constitutional amendment that would protect crime victims rights that then would be approved by Congress, sent to the states, and then be added if all goes well to our federal constitution.
And Sarah, any uh, thoughts from just the civil side of it? Um, I know you don't necessarily work within the criminal, but love to hear thoughts moving forward from the civil process and how do we uh, protect victims' rights? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of what, you know, Anna said, the, the, case, the cases in, in criminal law are brought by the state. Um, and, you know, we get, we get the, the, you know, the pleasure of getting to represent the survivor and, um, and being able to protect them. Um, you know, that's, in terms of Marcy's law stuff, you know, I have cases right now where we get to, from the civil side, protect the, the rights and interests of our clients going through the criminal process, because someone like Anna, you know, that's not her function, right? That's not her, that's not her, um, that's not her job. So again, I think, you know, I think um, working together on both sides of the coin, um, is important and um i'm just excited to be a part of this group you guys this is a great conversation this is this is how how change happens and i and i hope that everybody watching it's hard to not be able to look out and see the faces um of this audience but i i hope everybody's really taking this in and and you know does their part going forward because i think we really can make the world a, a, a better, safer place together. Thank you, Sarah. And I wanna give Paul and Anna a chance to any last statements that you guys would like um, for the audience to have as take home messages. Can mine uh, be uh, to let Sarah have the last word? It seems like at a conference that's trying to give uh, a face to victims and a voice to victims, her voice ought to be the one that uh, we leave ringing in everyone's uh, ears. That's amazing. And I'm such a fan girl right now. <laughs> so thank you, um, Professor Cassell. And, and I guess my final, my final thoughts um, would be if you could have seen me five or seven years ago, you would have seen a very different picture of a person with a very, very broken spirit um, who was not functioning and, and was in a way squandering, you know, my, my potential and squandering, you know, the gifts that, that I've been given. And through this process and through having these kinds of conversations and through having a, a beautiful prosecutor in our case and a judge who cared and civil attorneys who became family to us and this amazing army of not just sister survivors in the Nasser case, but, but survivors period and survivor advocates and just all the voices um, of many, many of, you know, the other people that are even at this conference today, um, we get better and, and we can get better and we can then do our part to affect change. And so, um, it's, it's been a transformative experience for me because every person in terms of the legal process played their part beautifully. Um, and that allowed me to get better and stronger and now be a voice for the voiceless. So everybody just keep doing your part. Your part matters. Um, and it is life changing, life giving work that so many of you are doing. And I, again, just gratitude. Um, they say healing comes from giving meaning to your suffering. So I often say, you know, the first 40 years of my life were almost unbearable, um, but in giving meaning to what happened and getting to do this work with all of you um, has, has made me get to the point where I can even have gratitude for what happened to me. So if anybody out there is listening who is a survivor um, or works with survivors, 
um, you know, it's, there's, there's a future for you and it's going to be bright and it's going to be beautiful. Just keep going. And so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I think that was a beautiful way to wrap up this panel. Um, just to bring this to a close, I want to thank all three of our panelists. Um, I think you guys provide such a wealth of expertise, knowledge, experience, um, and it's a great call to action for the audience and for all of us involved in this conversation to, as Sarah put it, to have these conversations, but take it one step further and to enact change and to go out there and do something about it. Um, and so with that, I want to say thank you to the three of you. Thank you to the audience who is taking part in this important conversation. Um, and then thank you to the University of Utah for giving us this venue to have this conversation and continue this. Um, with that, we have about 15 minutes till the next panel. Um, so everyone take a chance to stretch their legs, move around and come back for the last panel, which will be sure to be a good one. Thank you guys so much.